All right, well, it's, it's time, so we shall begin. This is machine learning for audio coding. This session is being recorded. Uh, as normal, uh, BCP 79 applies. So uh, uh, everyone here should be aware of and familiar with, with the ITF process requirements, particularly that, that if, it, if you're aware of any ITF contribution that's covered by patents or patent applications that are owned and controlled, by you or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. Uh, as a participant, you should be aware that there will be recordings, audio, video, written of the events and, and may be made public, um, and that personal information will be covered according to the ITF privacy policy. Uh, additionally, the RFC 7154 and 7776 ITF guidelines for conduct and anti-harassment procedures apply, so everyone should conduct themselves in a professional, collaborative manner. Uh, everyone in the room and should uh, be logging in via the NeedEcho client in order to get logged into the system. If you're not able to get in, there are QR codes up on the screen over there, as well as the blue sheet. And, uh, if you're in the room, keep audio and video turned off. Solutions over here for me to scan in. Use the echo, you only have to use the QR codes. Yep. And we have already established note takers and Zoom with people. So thank you. Thank you, Emily and Jonathan. Uh, I don't have listed on here. Oh, okay. The uh, so here's the agenda as we've sent out. Do we have any agenda bashing? The agenda can always be bashed. All right. Well, it appears there is no agenda bashing. And so, uh, Jean-Marc, can you come on? And I'll change the slides over. One moment. All right, Jean-Marc, you should have control over the slides. OK, you're still hearing me? Yes. OK, great. <clears throat> so I'm Jean-Marc. Uh, I will be presenting an update of the uh, deep redundancy for the, the Opus Codec draft. Um, this is a bit of a recap of last time because we sort of ran out of time. Uh, <clears throat> so essentially, what we're trying to achieve here is to make Opus robust to long bursts of packet loss. And the way we're doing it is through highly compressed redundant audio. <clears throat> we use uh, machine learning to achieve that. And for the purpose of testing, we've been working with, uh, you know, co uh, coding one second worth of redundancy in every 20 millisecond packet, which comes out to a redundancy factor of 50x. Um, <clears throat> and you can see at the bottom how this Thing is working overall. So in blue, we have the existing part of Opus right now, uh, you know, the encoder, the decoder, and in red is what we're adding. So on the encoder side, we're extracting features. So uh, essentially, these are features that are similar to what an ESR would compute. <clears throat> and then we encode those features, mux them with the main Opus content. And on the decoder side, depending on whether there was a loss or not, uh, we either decode regular Opus packet or we send the uh, the bits to a feature decoder. We get our features back, and those features are used to synthesize speech using a neural vocoder, so kind of similar to what you would have with a TTS system. It's just that you're uh, doing that from these acoustic features. Um, the way it works in practice is for efficiency purposes, we have an encoder that works forward in time. So every 20 millisecond, the encoder will compute um, <clears throat> both an initial state that I'll explain and sort of this, these uh, latent vectors. And these vectors actually represent 40 millisecond chunks 
despite the fact that they're computed every 20, which means they're, re they're in themselves redundant and we don't need to send all of them to be able to cover all, uh, all of the audio. And what gets sent to the other side uh, after you get a certain vector and a state from the encoder, you include the latest state in the packet that's going to be sent and every other latent vectors that the DNN produces. And so there's th an example for three consecutive packets that would be sent. Um, and on each of these packets, the decoder, if it needs to decode the features, it will work backwards in time. So it will get this initial state, which gives it the information about the latest audio, and then it can work backwards through time to figure out all the contents of the packets. Um, and the idea there is both to ensure that the encoder doesn't need to encode every packet 50 times because that would be very expensive computationally. And on the decoder side, uh, it's best to decode backwards in time because the most the frames that is the most likely to be used are the most recent ones. So the ones one second in the past are much less likely to be used. Uh, so that's the kind of the principle of how all of this works. Now, in terms of <clears throat> what's happening on the wire, this is the current proposed format for the extension. So we propose to use extension code 32, which means it's an extension that is meant to include more than just one byte, obviously. Um, Right now, we use we temporarily use extension ID 126, uh, which is reserved for experimental use. The um, <clears throat> so in terms of what the packet itself contains, first there's an offset, <clears throat> uh, which is encoded in five bits. The offset is meant to say how we are aligned between the features and what we're going to be playing back, because in some cases you may end up with different alignments and you need the uh, synthesizer to know exactly uh, where you are because we're encoding in chunks of 20 milliseconds, but there could be frames of, uh, you know, two and a half milliseconds used for Kelt, for example. So this sort of keeps track of where we are. Uh, so five bits there. Uh, we have a quantizer selection using four bits. Uh, the idea there is we can change the bit rate depending on how, mu how much loss we have, what kind of bit rate we have, and so on. So there's four bits that signal which quantizer we're using. And in addition to that, we have three bits for quantizer slope. Uh, and by quantizer slope, what we mean is that we're able to actually change the quantizer within the redundancy uh, so that the older frames are encoded at a lower bit rate. And so that slope, makes us control how quickly we reduce the quality uh, when we're going back in time. Uh, a slope of zero would mean everything at the same quality, but a non-zero slope means that the older packets are actually uh, encoded with um, lower quality. And that's a way of saving bits without affecting the overall quality too much. Um, so after that, we have this initial state that I described. Uh, it is now entropy coded in the latest implementation. Previously, it was a fixed bit rate, so that allowed us to save a few bits. And um, <clears throat> there's the latent vectors also that are then also entropy coded. <clears throat> and um, and th they're entropy coded until the end, and the end is when we have fewer than eight bits remaining in the packet. So that's uh, that way allows us to have, for example, to decide we're going to use like a fixed number of bytes for the redundancy. And we just don't signal the end. The decoder knows, okay, I've got less, fewer than eight bits, then uh, I stop decoding there. Uh, I think I see there's a raised hand. Uh, no? Yeah, sorry, um, I'm going to be lazy and not go to the uh, floor mic, but uh, as an individual comment, uh, is there any coupling between the opus uh, frame sizes and these redundancy uh, packet frame sizes, or they're totally independent, and there's no bearing on how Opus is operating? 
Uh, this is completely independent in that respect from the rest of Opus. The only link is this offset uh, field, which uh, tells us exactly how we're aligned in time. But otherwise, <clears throat> the dread format, essentially each of these latent vectors, they correspond to 40 milliseconds. So uh, we can encode in chunks uh, in increments of 40 milliseconds uh, redundancy. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so there's no coupling. Uh, in terms of, I mean, th there is coupling in terms of, you know, the implementation and the decoder because it needs to, uh, you know, switch back and forth between the two. Like that is not, uh, that is not simple, but in terms of the bits themselves, they're not coupled at all. So you can operate a Opus encoder and, or decoder at any frame size, and you can operate the redundancy at any redundant frame size independently. Well, the redundant frame size is always the same. It is multiples, it is like 40 milliseconds and you just include however many chunks of 40 you want. But that is completely independent. Cool. Uh, you, you could essentially like take the <clears throat> redundancy for one stream and put it in a different stream that's encoded with a different mode or something. And as long as you adjust the offsets, everything would work. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously, one question that comes up when we do machine learning is how we're going to standardize all this, uh, and we're trying to have like this balancing act where uh, we want to make sure the first criterion is all implementations need to be interoperable. You can't have one use one format or one DNN and the other one use something completely different, and they can't talk to each other. Uh, but the idea is also considering that to still leave as much flexibility as possible and, you know, emphasis on as possible because we can't leave everything flexible, just like any codec, like you need to specify something. Um, <clears throat> so what we are proposing here is <clears throat> to have essentially a normative specification for the part that converts bits into features. So it was uh, in my <clears throat> original figure, it was the first block of the decoder. So, and that part we can't really avoid standardizing. Um, it essentially would mean that all of the, the decoder weights, uh, so the DNN that does that would need to be frozen and specified. Uh, there's questions on how we're gonna publish that. Uh, that we'll need to resolve. And uh, then we'll also need the definition of these acoustic features. <clears throat> and once we have that, we should have something that is perfectly interoperable. And the encoder would be left unspecified. It just needs to <clears throat> be able to talk to that decoder. And similarly, uh, the vocoder, which is actually the most costly part of this entire thing, uh, that is also left unspecified. It just needs to be able to take the features that we standardize and output actual speech that corresponds to that. Um, <clears throat> so now a um, quick update on the actual implementation of all this. Um, so we recently were able to improve the quality from using a newer vocoder. Uh, which also turns out to reduce the complexity. So our complexity now uh, got reduced from about 10% um, CPU for a high loss case that we were where we were uh, at the time of the last meeting down to about 3% CPU right now. Um, and essentially that is for both encoding and decoding uh, using wideband silk. If we don't do any of the deep redundancy, we're about a 2% uh, CPU. These are absolute. Uh, so complexity got down by uh, a good amount. And there's also now no costs for the no loss conditions. So if you're not losing any packets, you're not paying for any of this. Um, there was also an issue with the size of the models themselves that was increasing the binary size. Uh, we got that 
down from about 17 megabytes last time down to about four megabytes now. Uh, still trying to shrink that a bit, but you know I think it's uh, in much better shape now. And uh, there's a link uh, still for the um, where the code is right now. Uh, it's the Opus NG branch in the Git repo. Um, and now there's still a few open questions uh, we can debate. One is, should there be a maximum amount of redundancy allowed? So far, we've been you kind of testing. Second? What? Can you hold on just one second? Tim, was your question on the last slide, or are you OK to go on to open questions? If I can manage to unmute my microphone. Uh, yeah, it was on the last slide. There you go. Um, yeah, so Tim Terry Berry, um, that four megabytes, what fraction of that is the bits to features decoder? Oh, yes, that's an important question. Uh, of the four megabytes right now, the decoder that would need to be standardized is about, uh, it's about one megabyte. Uh, again, ideally that should be a bit smaller. We're not going to do miracle, but... Uh, Still trying to shrink that a bit. Okay, thank the you. The rest uh, is mostly, uh, you know, the vocoder and the encoder. Um, so yeah, in terms of open questions, um, so we've been testing and discussing, you know, like redundancy of about one second, which seems to be a, a, a reasonable amount. Uh, but you know, technically, we can actually do up to about maybe 10 minutes, uh, which is probably not that useful for real-time conversation. But the question is like, do we leave? We, we suggest making it essentially open, like you know, 10 minutes probably won't fit your MTU, but I don't see a reason to say like, this is the maximal amount permitted. Uh, in the worst case, the decoder can just ignore what's in there, uh, but you know, it, it's out there. Um, and in terms of bit rates, right now we support, uh, if you do one second of redundancy, we support bit rates uh, th that would correspond to about uh, 10 to 100 kilobits per second worth of redundancy. Obviously, if you have more redundancy, it would be higher. Uh, that's basically equivalent to about uh, a range of about like 200 bits per second to two kilobits per second. If you if you look at it in terms of the content of one packet in itself, uh, yes, yeah. and that was my last slide, by the way. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. Um, this is maybe a somewhat more general question, but it just occurred to me while I was sitting here, so I thought I'd ask it. Um, I'm concerned. You know, as somebody who writes, you know, SFUs, what happens if I've spliced two streams and now I get the history from, is there a way for me to conveniently splice the redundancy history from, you know, from one packet, Opus packet to another if I, as I'm splicing audio streams together? Or is that going to be awful to parse this stuff at a middle box? Oh, you would. So what you're saying is you have two conversations that. Two, two different speakers and I switch. Which speaker I'm sending, and I'm so I mean, for whatever <clears throat> I'm, I'm putting them into the I'm merging them into a single stream. So maybe you need to think about this. Yeah, that's quite of an interesting use case. I had not thought about it at all. Uh, there may be something doable, but I would need to think of what all the implications are. Uh, okay. I definitely think it's a it's a potentially useful one. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then the other question, just to follow up on, on most question, you said that the frame sizes don't matter. So if you're encoding Opus at two and a half milliseconds and using this, do you get a different, the pre, the pre, the 20, the 40 milliseconds before the last two and a half milliseconds each time, or are there, how does that work? You're silent all of a sudden. Is your phone ringing? Jean-Marc, if you're trying to talk, Sorry. we don't. Yeah. yeah. Hello, okay, are you hearing me now? 
Yeah, I know. Okay, now. Sorry, but my phone tried to ring on my headset. Yeah, I know. Or, yeah, it cuts again. off your headset. It's awful. Um, yeah, no, I was saying that. So if you're encoding opus at two and a half milliseconds, yep. And does the deep redundancy do the, the 40 milliseconds before the last two and, a half two and a half milliseconds each time? So does that mean it's actually encoding a new deep redundancy every two and a half milliseconds, but switching which ones are there, or how does that work? So if you were to do two and a half milliseconds, what it would do is it would still work on these 20 millisecond chunks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one for one frame, it would say, okay, I'm computing the, my new initial, my new vectors and all that. Mm -hmm. And then the next frame, it's like, yeah, I don't have 20 milliseconds more. So it just reuses the last thing. The okay, encoder so will still send the entire redundancy in each two and a half millisecond packet, mm -hmm. or you could you could always tell it not to, yeah. but uh, it would still do that, but it would not re-encode every two and a half. It would still, uh, you know, run the DNN every twenty milliseconds. Okay, so there'd be sort and of like a, there'd be a gap, kind of. But yeah, and that's a reason for this offset thing, hmm. where you know the next two and a half millisecond, the offset would shift by two and a half because it's still the same redundancy that it's okay. Sending. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and yes, you would be missing maybe one frame there, but the there's like this is integrated with the PLC, so it would still, uh, you know, it would still work. It's just like one of the features would be kind of extrapolated. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, so just for the notes, um, on on Jonathan's first point, uh, Jean-Marc, you wanna you're gonna update uh, you're gonna do some update about uh, how splicing may work in the draft, splicing considerations. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I will first think about whether it can work at all, and I'll try to update the the mailing list. Uh, it would be cool if we get that to work. I just don't know how to, but maybe there's a way. So I think it's an it's an important consideration because I think people already naively do opus splicing, and there are already issues with just splicing opus at arbitrary boundaries, and adding this deep redundancy is compounding those issues. So if people do it naively and don't understand the implications. Um, you know, they're going to get audio artifacts. So it would be good to have a, a section about splicing yeah. and address both the opus issue and now this deep redundancy issue as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, like to, to, to be clear, like if you do it sort of in the dumb way of just forwarding the packet and not asking yourself what's in there, it's going to work. It's just that, you know, you're sending the packet from talker A. So if talker, if you lost packets from talker B, they're going to be forever lost, they're not going to be recovered. Um, and that, that would work, no artifacts, no, nothing wrong. The, the question I was answering to that I don't know if we can get it to work is, can we actually somehow merge the redundancy and get redundancy for both talkers A and B in that case? And that's the one I need to think through. Nothing's going to break. It's just like it may not work nearly as well as you would like. Are you okay with adding a splicing consideration section to the draft and, yeah. and address that? Yeah. yeah. We get to address that, please. Okay. Um, Yeah, in the oh, chat, Mark Harris says the security considerations would highlight the danger of potentially including earlier audio that was intended to be cut out, perhaps confidential information that could be decoded from the thread. Especially if it's 10 minutes long. So, so, sorry, say, say again? Basically, you know, the security considerations should mention that, you know, maybe you hadn't intended to have the last 10 minutes of audio being sent to this person. And that was, they were saying something confidential and they didn't realize that their audio would be forwarded. So. Uh, I mean, if if it's in the redundancy, it was already included in the opus pack, in the main opus pack. In, in the main opus packet, but maybe those opus packets weren't forwarded to somebody. Maybe this was before they joined the call. Oh, think, yeah. yeah. Okay. You just like a join, a late joiner, and the speakers didn't realize that the late joiner would have gotten the pre-joined messages. Fair enough. Yes. We have Tim again. Um, yeah, not, not to design at the mic or something here, but um, for your quantizer slope 
that's going to decrease things down to the minimum quantizer. Yep. Um, did you think it might be useful to be able to specify a floor that's higher than the minimum? So it, it drops down to that quality and then doesn't go any lower? Um, I'm open to that. It would eat a few more bits, but it's not fatal either. Um, I would I would welcome feedback on that one, essentially. I don't have like a strong opinion on the, the trade-off there between uh, bit rate control and the number of bits we transmit. Right, yeah, I'm not sure I have strong opinions either, but just looking at that 100 kilobits per second in 10 minutes, it's like whatever slope you put in there, you're gonna get down to almost nothing pretty fast. <laughs> well, as I said, like the 10 minutes thing is not, I'm not sure I see a use case right now. I'm just not sure I want to <clears throat> disallow it just for fun. <laughs> right, right. Um, my, my point is like there's there's a period of time somewhere in between one second and 10 minutes where you're always going to be lowering the bit rate to the minimum. You might not actually want that. Yeah, fair enough. All right, thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Looks like it covers the questions. Security. Um, you could have, if you're encoding at a frame size smaller than, than the, uh, than the, than the, than the paper out of the block size, then um, there's, it, it only encodes to two meters out of the base one millisecond. So there might be a small gap, but that's the issue. Okay, so um, hi, my name is Jan Büter. I want to give a brief update on speech coding enhancement for Opus. Um, yeah, the slide, please. So there are basically two aspects to this thing. Um, one is the actual algorithm development that's going on. So to develop low complexity speech coding enhancement methods, first with site on, uh, without site for info, later with, and also fully optimize this and integrate this into the op in, into lib Opus. And the second aspect is to um, standardize the whole thing. And the idea is now <clears throat> not to standardize the specific methods, but rather to standardize requirements that an enhancement method has to satisfy in order to be able to integrate it into Opus. So this way we have, um, <clears throat> we maintain the possibility of um, improving the models in the future. And there are th three different regions for mm, requirements first one regards the quality of the enhancement method itself. The second one is about um, integrating it into the Opus decoder so that switching still works and nothing breaks. And the third one is interoperability. Um, and I want to focus on quality today. Um, next slide, please. So first, an update about algorithm development. Last time I talked about um, LACE, the Linear Adaptive Coding Enhancer. That was the first attempt at um, improving um, Opus Silk. And now we have a new model, no LACE, that's rather new. And um, it has slightly higher complexity, but also um, gives higher quality. So you can see we are now uh, almost very or very close to clean speech quality at nine kilobits per second. Um, complexity is around 600 megaflops, which is still low for smartphones or lap laptop devices. And if you're interested, there is a paper and there is also a demo page where you can listen to samples. Mm, next slide, please. So uh, now we have basically two methods. That means we can start looking into um, quality evaluation. So we actually have something to test and to look at. And the general goal is to make sure that an enhancement method does not degrade Opus Silk. And the gold standard for evaluating this is um, to do a subjective listening test. So one like uh, the one where you have seen the results just now. Um, but this is first of all, very costly. 
And second of all, you can only test limited, a limited amount of data. And the alternative to that is to use objective metrics. Uh, however, they also have a drawback. I mean, they are cheap, but um, none of them is perfect. And they also tend to not age well. So we always find new ways to degrade a signal. And yesterday's um, <coughs> methods often fail to assess the quality accurately. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So what I did is I tested four different um, metrics. One that is PASC, it's very old and well-known um, method for evaluating perceptual quality of speech. Um, then WAPQ, which is a newer version that was designed to measure the quality of a neural speech codex because PASC didn't work. The third one is a modified version of the Opus Compare tool that's already standardized. And that uses a very simple psychoacoustic model to um, give a distortion um, metric. And the fourth one is a very new method called NOMAD, um, which is a distortion metric based on um, neural embedding. So there's a big neural net behind this. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing I did is you've seen we had some um, listening test results and I ran all these metrics with the same models on the same um, items and um, just to see how they compare. So you cannot compare values directly, but you can look at the quality ordering of conditions. And this is what you see down here. So above is the ordering of the listening test and then you can see Nomad gets two of them wrong. Um, modified opus compare and warp Q get uh, three of them wrong and PESC gets even more of them wrong. Um, but all in all, it's not perfect, but it's it's reasonable. And um, also a bit surprising that this op opus compare um, performed so well. Um, okay, so that was the first thing I wanted to show. And this next slide please. And the second, second thing is, um, so we also want to make sure that it actually detects degradation. And <clears throat> so we want to be able to distinguish good from bad enhancement models. And what I did to try this out was to use an almost untrained version of LACE and no LACE as an example of bad models. And um, LACE and no LACE, so when they are untrained, they are somewhat similar to the identity function. So it's not like they completely ruin the signal. You can still understand this but it is a noticeable um, degradation. So no complete catastrophe, but mm. noticeable degradation. Next slide, please. And um, so here are basically the results. Um, these are now all distortion metrics. That means lower is better. And you can see that all four methods have, so to say, mm, a certain margin uh, that separates good from bad models. Um, the results are, um, not completely satisfying for all metrics. You can see that for PASC and warp Q, actually the good models get rated down a bit, not much, but a bit um, for higher bit rates. And for modified Opus Compare and NOMAD, the bad models are actually seen as an improvement at very low bit rates. So <clears throat> you can use tight thresholds like over here, but then you would request, so to say, that you so if you would say we want to have um, a certain amount of quality improvement with a modified Opus Compare, then you can separate them. Um, but then you have to say the actual method has to improve. You cannot say, as it was stated in the beginning, that it should not compare, uh, it should not degrade. Um, but all in all, it, it seems feasible to do this. And next slide, please. Um, so to sum this up, so all four of these metrics. Um, seem capable of separating good from bad models. And so a test based on metric dependent thresholds um, should likely catch issues with enhancement models. And um, depending on the metric, one might uh, have to allow um, a little bit of degradation at higher bit rates. Also regarding the performance of the metrics themselves. So NOMAD uh, seems to perform best all in all but it, is, it would be quite difficult to standardize. So it's a neural network with 95 million parameters. 
and warp queue and modified opus compare. They are very simple methods. Um, modified opus compare even more than warp queue. So that would be quite easy and straightforward to standardize. And ask is already standardized, but it performs worst. So these are the findings. Hmm. And in terms, the next slide, please. Thank you. And in terms of um, next steps, so the algorithm development itself, what's currently uh, ongoing is to really integrate them into um, Opus on the Opus NG branch, next generation, do some size and complexity optimization, and also to um, investigate noisy speech performance that's already ongoing. And I can already share that these models that are just trained on clean speech perform um, pretty well also on noisy speech. Um, another thing we are looking at is to add bandwidth extension. Um, so for instance, at 12 kilobits, um, decode or invent uh, full band uh, speech or turn wide band speech into full band speech and also to add site information. And for standardization, the next steps would be to assemble some test vectors for the test like uh, the one I just um, outlined and to assemble them from open data sets. So the listening test data set was proprietary. Um, then spell out some requirements for clean speech and the noisy speech test. And the question is a little bit how strict or lenient one should be and whether we should use one metric or allow multiple metrics or even require multiple metrics, maybe even allow a listening test on a subset. That's still, um, so if anyone has an opinion about this, I'd be happy to hear this. Yeah, and that's it then already on my side. Next slide. Six, thank you. Yes, thank you. Any questions about this work? Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Um, yeah, so back on the slide with the table of thresholds. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what that's basically saying is that some of these metrics disagree about whether these your your models are actually an improvement at high bit rates like yes. do we know do we know if they're correct or like which ones are correct oh i mean we don't have a ground truth listening test the only thing i did was to listen to um outlier um signals and i did not hear any degradation so um i tend to believe that um the metrics are incorrect, especially PESC um, has this kind of nervous breakdown where suddenly it would rate an item way down with a score of, I don't know, three or so, and you don't hear a difference. So that's, that's kind of the problem of uh, the method uh, aging not well. Um, so, I mean, the best thing would of course be to to, to also have a listening test at a certain point at these higher bit rates, um, maybe do a Mushra test. But at the moment, I'm, I'm led to believe that it's um, a shortcoming of the metric. So in, in the video space, um, uh, some people created metrics which are basically composites of other metrics. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything like that being useful here or um, are some of these already composites of something else? Um, no, they are pretty standalone. Um, to avoid this divergence problem, to avoid this where you know you have conflicting signals from different metrics. If there's a composite metric that takes into account multiple of them and has rules for how to deal with divergence. I mean, if we, make this, if we make this mix bit rate uh, dependent, then it's easy to achieve. Um, yeah, this is something to look into. Um, that's actually a good suggestion. Yes. Mm. Yeah, my, my only other comment is, um, no. you know, just, just to echo feedback I gave you before the meeting, um, that if you, if you look on the previous slide, I believe it was, um, 
no, maybe it's not in this version, but the the signal you're comparing to is just the high pass version that you know that that already has the high pass filter that Opus uses internally, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but that's that's not the only change that the Opus encoder makes to the original signal, right? It also does like um, bandwidth expansion of the LPCs to try to to enhance formants. Um, and that's not reflected in what you're trying to compare to here. So I think there, you'll need to take some care of what what the actual correct reference sh signal should be, right? I um, can easily rerun this with just the clean input signal. It's so to say, I mean, <clears throat> the reason for taking this signal is basically that you get phase shifts um, from the high pass filter. Right. Um, so. It, the, some of the metrics might react badly to that. Um, but I will rerun this and um, I can share the results. So uh, I will look into it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, I, I'm not sure that, that just going back to the, the original clean signal is necessarily going to make the most sense, right? Like, like there's two questions, right? Like, one, one is, are you degrading, you know, the original, the original input to the, to the encoder more than Opus encode was already degrading it. Maybe going back to the original input would answer that question. Um, but the other question is, is like if, if Opus, the Opus encoder is doing some enhancements to the speech before it encodes it, um, are these methods that then get closer to the, that original input signal, like undoing those enhancements, right? And would they be penalized if they didn't undo them? Yes, I actually have to check. So um, from what I remember, it was really just the high pass filter that was applied. Um, but I will have to check this carefully to see whether there's any format enhancement going into the reference that's, that shouldn't be. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my question is like, should there be? Right, like if, if, if the Opus encoder is making additional changes to the signal and you know, your, your evaluation criterion for are you compliant is, is you know, are you making an improvement to over what the Opus encoder did? Um, are you then gonna be penalized if you don't undo the things that the Opus encoder did? Mm. Right, I, basically I'm try, trying to ensure that we still have some flexibility in encoder design. I, I think I can answer some of this here. Jeremiah, okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Jean-Marc Um I can answer, I think, some of this. So <clears throat> actually, as part of what the encoder does, so the high, you know, as uh, Jan mentioned like the high pass filter will mess the phase up. So we tried to remove it from the equation. Everything else should be in there. Um, <clears throat> the form and stuff actually we're no longer doing in the latest version, but it used to be done, but it was all about undoing <clears throat> some, like it was, the encoder was doing bandwidth expansion to undo some of the other stuff it was doing later on. So we want to include all of that in the comparison. I, I really think the only exception there should be the uh, the high pass filter, just because it uh, you know it messes with the phase, but it's otherwise irrelevant. But I don't think there's an issue there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to also answer uh, if there's still time to uh, Mo's question about the metrics. Um, <clears throat> where is it? So essentially, so video metrics are hard. Audio metrics, I think, are even harder. Uh, and I don't want, I don't think we should get into designing new metrics because that's an insanely hard problem. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of the idea of what <clears throat> uh, Jan was doing here, which is ju to just look at what's already out there and pick something that seems reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> All 
right, Tim, do you want to go? Sure. Assume you guys can still hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. All right. Um, so I'm Tim Terryberry. This is discussing the extension draft. Um, so ju just to refresh people's memory of what, you know, in case you don't have RFC 6716 uh, bit diagrams memorized, um, this is sort of the structure of an Opus packet. Um, there are uh, four different uh, framing formats defined in the RFC. The, the first three are just for one or two frames with the same or different sizes. Um, but the third one's cleverly named code three, uh, includes this extra frame count byte. So you can have an, an arbitrary number of frames up to 120 milliseconds. Um, and in that frame count byte is also this padding bit, which allows you to add additional padding. Um, so in order to add extensions, we need to use a code three packet, um, enable the padding bit, and then encode a padding length. Um, and the length is just a, a simple encoding that you know represents up to 254 bytes of padding with a one byte length and then adds additional bytes um, if you need to have more padding than that. Um, but basically that means in order to turn um, extensions on, we, we spend two bytes, one for the frame count byte to use a code three packet and one for the padding length variable. Um, and then we can add extensions at the end of that packet. All right. Um, so the actual format of the extensions is, is illustrated here. And so the, you start with an, a, a one byte that has an ID and this L flag, which specifies how the, the length is encoded. And that changes depending on what your, your ID is. Um, so for ID zero, um, L equals zero just means treat the entire rest of the packet as padding um, in the original definition. So it must be zero, um, decoder must ignore it. Um, if L equals one, then you just get one byte of padding. Um, for IDs one to 32, um, L equals zero means you have no payload and L equals one means you have one byte of payload. And then IDs 32 to 127, um, you encode a a length for L equals one, and it's the rest of the packet for L equals zero. Um, so after that, that length, you have the, the payload. And because um, in a code three packet, you can have multiple Opus frames packed together, um, we have these separators um, that separate the extensions for each of the Opus frames. Um, and those are, encoded using an extension with ID equals one. All right, any questions on that? Great. Um, so just go over the draft status. Um, this was adopted as a working group draft in the last meeting, so we published that. Um, and then a, a zero one with updates that were discussed in that meeting and, and on the list. Um, and so hopefully none of this stuff should be a surprise, um, but we reserved ID 127 for more extensions. Um, basically kept the, the length coding same as IDs 32 to 126 so that someone who doesn't understand those future extensions can just skip it. Um, and so far we're leaving the contents of what the actual payload of, of ID 127 is just up to the subject of a future draft if we ever need it. Um, I may be the person in the room who least understands offer answer semantics, um, but I did try to do some digging and found in, in RC 5576, um, it tells you that, that media level format parameters must not be carried over blindly, which makes sense to me. Um, it basically means that that if you want to describe what extensions that you support in STP, you know, you're going to have to upgrade your SFU to understand extensions. I don't think there's an automatic mechanism we can specify that will just work. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, um, I guess the multiple frames thing made me think, how does that 
I mean, and maybe this needs to be specified, but dread, but how, do, what frame is the dread associated with? The last one? Do you have to? Um, well, so you can specify it however you want, right? Like the, the idea um, is, is it's presumably not useful to specify it to attach. It, it's it to presumably it. not useful, but but I mean, my 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 point is, is like, you you can encode it in this extension format to apply to any particular packet, right? And and the thing that would make, or any particular Opus frame in that packet. Now, the, the thing that would be useful is is you want to have it on the first frame, because you want to cover all the stuff that you lost before you receive this packet. And it doesn't make sense to have it on the last one and have redundancy for frames that are in the same packet, because presumably you didn't lose them. Um, but but the point is 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 the separators let you make that distinction, and in particular, if you did something completely naive where you just copied over whatever extensions were associated with the packets you received when you were like combining multiple packets or multiple packets into a single packet with multiple frames, um, then it would still all just work. Like you would know, you would know which, uh, which frame the dread was based on, on these separators. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jean-Marc has his hand up. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jean-Marc. Uh, very quickly, um, <clears throat> to complete the answer, um, <clears throat> one of the goals of this frame separator is, is that for, not for Dread, but for some of the extensions we're planning, uh, for example, if you have enhancement extensions, you actually want to transmit all of them and you need to make sure they're actually associated with the right frame. And if you were to split them again later, then you again want everything to follow. So that, that's why we need this uh, separator thing. All right, um, let's see, so I, I also clarified in the draft um, that support for extension IDs zero and one does not need to be explicitly signaled via A equals FMTP. Um, and the reason for that is that if you don't support those extensions, you won't be able to parse the rest of them. So it's not useful to be able to say, I don't support zero and one. Um, uh, also ask uh, extensions to specify whether or not they can appear multiple times for the same frame in a packet. Uh, I think that was one of the previous discussion points. Um, and I think it's it's OK to allow it. Um, but if an extension doesn't want it, then they need to tell us it's not OK. Um, and then just a few other minor edits for, for wording and clarity. Um, so one of the things I noticed in, in doing these updates is that we actually have two future extension mechanisms. Um, so I talked about the i equals zero, l equals zero is, makes the rest of the frame into padding again. Um, and the, the fact that you must set it to zero in the encoder and must the decoder must ignore it um, is basically the same set of rules that lets us add these extensions. So you could extend things recursively. Um, basically you get a, a a, a complete redo of the extension format should we want one in the future uh, with a one byte overhead to stuff them into the current extensions. Um, the problem with using that as an extension mechanism just for you know, higher extension IDs as opposed to the, the ID equals 127 approach is that you don't have these separator bytes because once you signal that you're, you're using padding, that that eats the rest of the packet. So you can't add a separator later to, to switch to a different frame. Um, so the ID equals 127 approach, you know, has a nice defined length. Um, it can be skipped and mixed with other extensions um, and it can reuse the separator structure. So you don't have to signal that twice just to use uh, extra extensions. So I, I think it's useful to have both of these. I don't think there's a problem with it, but I just wanted to point it out if people hadn't thought about it. Um, finally, things that we have not done yet. Um, so I did not split out the IANA registration for L equals zero and L equals one modes for IDs two to 31. 
Um, basically, I'm not sure there's a, a lot of use cases where you would want to have an extension that allows both a zero byte payload and a one byte payload. Um, it seems like they're, they're kind of distinct use cases. Um, so if we, we don't allow them to be registered separately, um, then you know we, we basically have the amount of extension ID space we have for these. Um, and these are the, you know, maybe we don't really need 31 of these, um, but, or 30 of these, I mean, um, but the idea is, is, you know, this, this is kind of a limited space. Um, so we should think about if we want, want to do that or not. Um, and it, it is something we have to decide up front um, because these will be signaled in the, the A equals FMTP signaling. Um, yes, go yeah. ahead, Jonathan. Other than the separators, do you have any things that you're thinking these basically flag by extensions will be useful for? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so certainly, like you, you might imagine um, an enhancement method that only needs to send a very small amount of side information, and if you're just going to send eight bits, having another eight bits to signal a length is you know a lot more I mean, overhead. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of something uh, like bandwidth yeah, extension but I mean, but, here. But how many of these the zero length ones are you going to have? Is so that just a flag? It's there or it's not? Yeah, yeah, and, and I don't know. The answer might be you know none, right? Yeah. Um, th that's the hard thing about trying to predict the future. So it's probably not a big deal. Um, but we should make a decision. Um, so I think Mo had suggested switching to quick varants for the extension IDs. Um, and initially, I kind of liked that idea um, because number one, it means you, you're you're essentially the L flag is going to get folded into the extension ID to start with. Um, so it would answer the previous question. Um, but it does reduce the available one byte extension IDs from 118 down to 30, which seemed kind of drastic. Um, so I did not make that change. Um, so just, just to clarify, I, I, um, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, specifically enamored with uh, Quick's variants, but I just, in general, you know, there's many variable length encodings that are popular. Um, like Tim, I'm, I'm sure you probably remember everyone's um, uh, LE 128, uh, so that you know, variant uh, type encodings that may be more compact or may, for smaller spaces than quick variants may be more applicable here. Yeah, I, I mean, I think 64 bit uh, <laughs> extensions, <laughs> so quick variants may be uh, too big of a sledgehammer, right? And I think, as, as, as Jean Marc kind of points out, like. Um, you know, if you're going to be putting these in a giant switch statement, you're, you're not going to have 64, 64 bits worth of them, right? Um, or even 32 bits worth of them. Um, so I think like at the point that we need that many extension IDs, it, it feels like we're going to be encoding actual data in the extension ID, which I don't know, seems weird, but maybe there's a use case for that. But um, Yeah, if you have if you have another proposal that you think makes more sense than the current one, um, I think it's worth considering. But but so far, I have not not tried to do that. Um, and then finally, we didn't reserve any unsafe extension IDs. Um, ID some somewhere some, an extension ID where if, if you don't understand it, you throw away all the rest of the extensions. Um, so I don't think we have any clear use cases for that. Um, that was an idea that, that I had put forward as, as something that might be useful, but I haven't, haven't seen a concrete use case for it yet, so I haven't added it. All right, and that's my last slide. All right, <clears throat> any further questions? So you already have updates that, that are in uh, that are pending, Tim, for, for the next version, of the worker draft. Or are you waiting for feedback from people to do an update? Uh, I, I'm currently waiting for feedback. I don't have anything else in the queue. Okay. Um, I, I will point out that that 
our milestones say that that this is going to the ISG in December, yeah. which seems soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't come up with that date, but. <laughs> so there's not many people physically in the room here, but um, for everyone else online, uh, please let's get some reviews of this document in. Um, it's a short document, easy read, um, but it'd be really useful to get some some more reviewer feedback. Um, give Tim some guidance on what changes may be needed for the next version. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to see um, some more feedback before I think it's ready for ITF last call anyway. <laughs> Thank you. We're done. Six on the nose. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Really kind of worried that we would we got a slow start, but Jan, yeah, Jan sped us up. <laughs> yeah, I thought he would have the largest. Uh, the yeah, he had. Breeze there. Yeah, I think I missed that he had a stop in the middle and then some backup slides behind it. So, is that it for you? Or are you interested in anything else? Oh, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be around. I'm not actually sure what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did you find out if I have to do something for ABT Core? Yeah, so it looks like the, uh, the, the boilerplate paragraph will my mushroom.